Hello and welcome to Cardiff Central, your one-stop shop for all things Cardiff rugby. Um, so I'm joined as ever by Carwin. How are you doing, Carwin? Yeah, not too bad, Harley. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing well. Uh, I, I think we'll go into the reasons why I'm feeling so great as we come. But before we do that, I'd like to bring on a uh, introduce a special guest to the pod. So we've got Steve Coombs from CF10 and also a co co-author of the co-author. Of Give me a producer credit as well. Go um, off the producer. One of um, the team behind the blething. Yeah. Um, so how are you doing, Steve? I'm t- tell you what, I'm in a much better mood than I would have been this time last week. <laughs> um <laughs> because I can't lie, after the Zebra game, I was pretty pissed off. But in the aftermath of the Stormers game, I'm I'm a lot happier. Doing good. Yeah, I, th- I think I think we go. So shall shall we just run should we run straight into the uh, storm to the Let's storm game? It. Um, Steve, as our guest, do you want to kick us off? Um, <laughs> the Stormers game. Um, before the match, I'll be honest, I was dreading it slightly because we had rested a few players, and going by the first fourteen minutes, sit standing on the terrace, I was thinking, is this going to be a game too far? Have they expanded a lot of emotional and physical energy in the past few matches? And are they now going to hit a bit of a wall? But that shows how little I know because they came firing back. And I think as the second half wore on, the crowd really... A feature of the last two matches actually has been the crowd has been absolutely buzzing at the Arms Park, really getting behind the team. And I was feeling like if we mess this one up again and we go down to another narrow loss or another draw, I might need therapy after this game. <laughs> but but luckily, yeah, they pulled through. And I it's a little early to say, but this could be a real turning point in the season, I think. And it's well tightened because there are some big games coming. Yeah, definitely. I think I was like, we were saying on the pod last week that you know we were after the run of losses, we weren't sure where uh, where the next win was coming from because we seem to be missing out on all the games in theory we should be winning. Mm. Um, I think I I don't know about you, Carwin. I was quite happy because I think two of our biggest our biggest prop biggest issues from the last few weeks seem to have been addressed. So first of all was leadership. We didn't seem to be there didn't seem to be anyone guiding the team through, and the other and then um we had well me especially were wasn't particularly happy with the way Sherrod was using his bench. And that, you know, when he did bring players on, they didn't seem to have an impact or he was leaving people on. Uh I I think this time round we swapped it round. I think, you know, Ellis Jenkins being a fantastic example. Yeah, he was superb all game. Um, you know, you mentioned little things that he does, the the turnover that eventually leads to the final try, that's him. But the the keyest example obviously is that um, that clip that's been doing the rounds, I think it's from Scrum 5, where they've got him on, um, him mic'd up, which for anyone listening, that needs to be week in, week out, in my opinion, because it is such a lovely insight into pl- how players interact with each other, whether it be, um, you know, organising defensive structures, whether it be celebrating tries, it's just brilliant to hear. Um, but yeah, him, Mackenzie Martin's just come on and he's turned to Mackenzie Martin and he said, right, you're a, a plus one and then you scoot out basically and it's it, it, essentially teaching on the pitch because Mackenzie Martin's probably done a handful of line out calls so far this season he's been in and out of the side he's probably learning learning his trade still well he's definitely learning his trade still and that is the leadership and that obviously leads to the Mason Grady try which was you know so brilliantly executed you know that's yeah, it was uh, some panache in that. It, was, it, it reminded me of uh, Tony Woodcock World Cup final, to be honest. That sort of uh, sort of set piece plan working to a T. You know, it's, uh, it's really nice to see a line out move actually work. Yeah, you see teams try a little you know line out move every other game now, <clears throat> and nine times out of ten they do not work. So it's it's a bit of a thrill just to see a team try a pre plan line out move, and it it comes off a treat. Also, it's a simple one. It's not. It's yeah. not that complicated. It's Ellis Jenkins takes the ball down and pops it basically to Mason Grady, 
but you've got runners going here, there and everywhere drawing the eye line. You've got the threat of the driving wall. It's just where it was situated and how it was executed and brilliant. Um, yeah, I I just really, really like that bit of leadership from Ernest Jenkins. And you, we spoke, spoke about leadership and the bench, you know, Turnbull coming on. I thought he was he was brilliant off the bench as well. And, and another couple of players that stood up from the bench as well, Reese Carey and um, and Litterick as well. They They were both superb off the bench to, to um, had a real impact yeah absolutely um think of that lineup move though i feel like it works purely because the personnel we had because we've got a we had a flanker who's normally in that plus one so they're usually only either going to be at the tail of the line you know they're going to be going into the mall or pulling out we had ellis jenkins who you know is a he's you know almost a scrum half an extra scrum half at times of his passing off the base and you have max llewellyn who looks for all intents and purposes, like he should be in the second row. So having him in the line now, if you're not position player and you're focusing on what you're doing, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, that's, well, that's just the second row. And I think, then I think you've gone back two. a year there, Harley. Yeah, you called yeah. Mason Grady, <laughs> Max Llewellyn. Big yeah, signing yeah. there. Uh, I'm having, I, I do at least one of these every every pod. There's always one. <laughs> but, we all yeah, want so him back, but I don't think I really want back. him back, and he's just being wasted on the title bags at Gloucester. But yeah, Matt, um, yeah, I feel like I've really done Mason a disservice there because, my word, he was playing like he had a point to prove. Yeah. What a what a game! Just barreling through. I swear, at one point he was looking, he was running in the field trying to find a Stormers play he hadn't run through yet, <laughs> just to run through him. There was a moment, I think, in the second half where he, I think, he went through three people, and there was a very, very loud Stormers fan, sort of just over my right shoulder, who was very very you know, rowdy throughout the game and, and why not but af- after that run I turned around and this I could see the colour sort of draining from this guy's face because in South African rugby I, they kind of pride themselves on being able to physically out muscle people so to see the opposition do you know, basically brushing off defenders um, that's a Having someone like that is a real psychological blow for you in, in your favour. I mean, even when it ends up going nowhere. I mean, I think at the end of that run, he tried a, a ridiculous offload, which didn't go to hand. But in a way, it doesn't matter because it's a psychological blow in your favour. It really throws the momentum back in your favour. Mm. Yeah, and it, yeah. it seemed like he was carrying for days. But I reckon he could have just be carried on for well past the 18th. Yeah. Um, so... The person who was on the other wing for most of the game, because unfortunate to hand injury to Harry Millard, was um, Aimer Webb, and I think we've done a good bit of business there. I think he looked. He was enjoying I he looked, himself. I think he looked really well, yeah. and I think it does help. It does show how having an actual winger on the wing helps helps mm. the team. But you well, know, he's still a young. He's still a young lad, and I thought you know the, that that's another guy with a point to prove. You see, mm. yeah, that that's a guy who's been released by Bath after a really promising start to his career. Mm. He's gone away to New Zealand, played for Southland, which isn't even a particularly fashionable team in New Zealand NPC terms. And he's coming back, trying to re-establish himself in professional rugby, and he's given it his all. And I think we're really benefiting, or starting to see the benefit from having players in the squad who have got a bit of a chip on their shoulder and have a point to prove. Yeah. yeah, and you need. And, a bit uh, of that. I, I, well, I think the whole fifth, well, the whole twenty-three had a point to prove. You know that that's yeah. that's we, we've talked about our frustrations last week. You know, if 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 if, they, if anyone had listened to our pod last week, they'd have they'd have realised that we were frustrated. Fans were frustrated. I'm sure the mm-hmm. players were more frustrated than anyone. And that was that was a performance of a point to prove. And you know, after it was a performance I didn't see coming after 16, 17 minutes. I must be honest. Um, that at that stage I was start, you know, I was working um behind the scenes on that one and I thought I was starting to think, well, I might be uh, turning this one off soon if I can find another thing to do. But um, you know, then you mentioned Haber Webb's try, which uh owes massive thanks to an assist by uh, Tina Stabia, who uh, I must admit I screamed at not to kick the ball, but that was definitely the right option. <laughs> um the grubber kick through for uh well, I, I still think Cam Winnett has basically gifted Hibble Webb the try because he basically runs past the ball if anyone's seen it win it I'm pretty sure Cam Winnett could have dotted that down but has gone ah go on then <laughs> you might as well 
it was a typical winger sort of like i am i am finishing this yeah. like <laughs> make sure T tunnel vision ball try line i want that yeah yeah which is that, good well it's good yeah yeah, it, it, we, we talked about the, that. The best we wingers have that. Exactly. I, I think of how many try. You know that that famous Shane Williams try against Scotland. Why on earth is he running the ten channel underneath the post? No one knows, but he's done it because he wants to get over the white lush. whitewash. Sorry, and uh, I thought that was brilliant from him. But uh, as well, yeah, it seems to be a. Uh, I've um, questioned him a few times, but after uh, he had a shaky first fourteen minutes, but after then I thought he was superb, um, and that little grubber kick as well was brilliant. The thing with that Hamer Webb try for me that I really I didn't I, I point out on um 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 Carlos Rugby Carlos Rugby Life as well because he he shared the clip of it. It went the first four players you see around the ball when it's in the goal mm. area is Cam Winnett, Mason Grady, Hamer Webb, and Alice Jenkins. That was four Cardiff players before you saw a Stormers player like the sh the sheer like effort to go and do that when you like. There were a couple of players there who you basically could have you could have switched off. You could have seen that your team was scoring. Do you know what? Right, we'll just get ready. Get you know, start getting them over there. No, we're all getting in there. We're all gonna get there. We're gonna get separate breaks. And I think that was a point for me when I realized we were properly in this game. I mean, I know it mm. took us, that score took us, well, 14, 17 or something like that. It you know, it so you know, math numerically we we're in the game, but that was the one where I thought, actually, no, this is you know, despite having some issues at the scrum, which we were always gonna have with a with the the pack storm was brought down. You know that was that was a bit to me. I went, oh, hang on, they've got. And the thing is, we we converted our chances more. You know, we seem to convert more chances than we let go, which has been something we haven't quite done, yeah. managed the last few seasons. It wasn't perfect. I, I, granted, there were some cock ups, but it was better than the last five weeks have been. I, and I, that I for me, we... you know, if we've got an improvement, which I was happy with. I think we've improved every week. Um, and I mean, we mentioned Matt Sherratt earlier. I'm really impressed by Matt Sherratt so far for a couple of reasons, but um, mainly because he's improved, the, the team has improved every week under his watch. I mean, he was saying earlier in the season, yes, our attack in play isn't where we need it to be, but it's not going to be. Because did you look at the preseason we had? Players are coming in late, you know, Willis Alahalo and really low left and then came back. The beers coming in late, et cetera, et cetera. But given time, we'll improve. And that looks like an excuse, except for the fact that he's right. They have got better every week. And now we are a much sharper attacking team. Um, and I think, you know, the last couple of performances have been put in against Benetton and uh, Dragons and, dare I see it, Scarlet's away. Um, we probably would have come away with wins from those games, if not, you know, full five points. Yeah, yeah, I think. It's, no, yeah. I, I, sorry, sorry. Go on, Harley. Yeah, I was going to say, I was just, I completely agree. You know, like, I mean, if you look at the games we lost, obviously we we, we did beat Dragons, even though that that's probably quite rightly our worst. It was, it, it, was, it was closer than I would have liked. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it, you know, it was, you know, we won, and that was probably our worst performance. And then yeah. the other games, which are so close, and you're thinking, if this team we played on Saturday, on Friday night, played those games, I think we we'd win. We'd be on four out of six, you know. We'd be on four or five out of six. I'm trying not to think to how many six. points we could have because it did just it upsets yeah. me. <laughs> I, I but, something yeah. some something some people I've, I've been talking to have said to me is those results probably by the end of the season will actually look quite good. I'm mm. actually thinking we're going to be looking back towards the end of the season, thinking actually no, we really should have got those points because we'll look at how well we're playing and think. Yeah, but I agree. We're definitely looking better. The, the one. The ones, sorry, I was just going to say the one for me that frustrates me is still the Benetton one because that mm -hmm. was the Benetton without all their Italian stars. Yes, okay, we were also, Cardiff were also without several internationals, don't get me wrong, but that was such an opportunity. And Benetton are flying. Benetton are playing really well, don't get me wrong, but I thought that was a key game at the start of the season and real opportunity. And I think, but. But uh, let's let's not look at the negatives. Come on, let's talk about the positives. Let's yeah. talk about the let's talk about a tight end scoring from eighty yards. Come on, um, <laughs> to win a game. <laughs> let's let's talk about the most beautiful pressure kick of the whole URC that round, coming from Seb Davis. All right, you can say it was a bit lucky that Clayton managed to drop it twice, 
But I mean, you know, that you know, I mean, the kick was there, exactly there was, where it needed to be. There was such be. a spin on that kick. If he did it deliberately, he's he's a genius. I mean, the the the, the spin on it was always going to make it bounce awkwardly. Um, I I don't know whether he practices that. I mean, for Seb, he is an you know he he was you know he started out his career as sort of more of a playmaking twelve, and then got very big, and they threw him in the rope. You yeah. know, whereas I imagine if he was coming through now, they probably would have made him a twelve, similar to what they've done with. Uh, Mac, Max and Grady when they came through they Possibly, went, yeah. you know I, th- I think about five years six years ago they would be made into, no, no you're big you're going in the pack I don't care if you can handle you're going in the pack no it's a case of oh you're really skillful right well yeah be a, be a massive back great you mm. can run through South Africans for fun and I mean I feel like Seth sort of did on purpose but also at the same time it did seem very panicked I mean again going back to Alice's leadership in small moments you know it was him who got that turnover yeah. Against the head. Um, speaking of great turnovers, Alex Mann with a fantastic counter ruck again, and then Ellis Jenkins passed it off for Carrie to bust up. It, you know, it was it was not like all the parts seemed to start clicking. Whereas I think other weeks, you know, we were dropping ball balls because people weren't quite where they needed to be. Yeah. And today I thought it was, you know, probably even it was so much better. I'll... It it just sort of made me feel really good. I mean, I've just come off the wrap and just have this massive smile on my face, just listening to everything else everyone's saying. I'm like, I don't care. We've beaten the Stormers two <laughs> years in a row. <laughs> yeah. As as someone who has played with Seb, um, at, well, going to the school level, uh, where he was a 13 for us, um, it was luck. <laughs> but he's a very skillful <laughs> player. Used to goal kick and all sorts. So he's got a good left peg, but uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not buying that whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I'm prepared benefit, to see benefit the doubt. Um, but yeah, uh, I, know. I, I actually thought he played really well um, as well. But uh, it's hard. To, it's hard to pick players who didn't play well. I thought. You know, you mentioned Carry there with his bust. It wasn't just that one. There was there was another one as well yeah. through midfield. You know, using him as a ball carrier um, through midfield. I'm starting to wonder whether someone might suggest picking him in the back row and giving him a shot, seeing how he turns out in the back row as a sort of Xavier Rush, Rush replacement. But um, um, I, I, I just everything about the second half performance seemed assured. Um, you know, not leading for most of the game, don't, but also not out of control. There was never panic. There was never worry. You know, Mackenzie Martin comes on. You get a scrum just under the sticks. He makes ten yards to um, set up the final try. But, you know, he's an unfortunate not to score. It's it's all the components came together. The whole team seemed to be on the same wavelength and you mentioned Sherrett improving the team as a whole yes but also individuals are still rapidly rising and Alex Mann is improving head over heels you know that small mistake he made against Scarlett a few weeks ago versus a really assured defensive display on the weekend like um, I'm really excited about where the Cardiff side could go Um, and yeah, as as Steve mentioned earlier, with some big, big games to come over the Christmas period, um, and some big derbies, you know, Scarlet's gonna be reeling after one of them. So we'll we'll see how um how that goes. The other player that I think needs a mention after that game is Alice Bevan. Mm-hmm. Because he's another player who at the start of the season you'd probably say, Okay, well, he's got potential. You can see, you know, he's quite quick. He he looks fairly assured for a relatively young player, but he's now becoming a proper player. I mean, that that penalty kick save towards the end quite possibly saved the game for us. I yeah, thought it, his kicking got better as the game went on. He's He looks like a leader. He doesn't mind mixing it. And I don't think we've seen much of him in full flight yet, but he's a very, very quick player. Like winger quick. So you know, he's another one who you can see becoming more and more of a, a key player for Cardiff, not just this season, but the next few seasons. I think on that, he needs someone to just give him that confidence to sometimes say, you know, if it's on to show and go, show and go, mm, just go yeah. for it. And someone needs to just, just get around him and say, because at the moment he's, um, the, the way I would say is, is he's tidy, 
without being electric. He's not added that. And I, I, from what you're saying and having seen bits and bobs, he does have that ability, but he hasn't yet shown it as much. I think, yeah. I think he's still in that learning phase of not wanting to do anything wrong, wanting to make the right decisions. Whereas yeah. sometimes as a nine, you need to, you need to find that bit, extra bit of spark. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think as well, because it obviously, you know, this is Jockey's first season in charge. You know, we've got the attack going through that. You know, maybe they're saying, but we know you can do that. We'll bring it yeah, in later. Yeah. But let's get the system nailed because we're not, yeah. you know, we're, you know, even in the Storms game, we we're probably only about 75, 80% nailed on on that system, attacking system. And, well, you know, everyone's in exactly the right place where they need to be to break the line. That maybe, you know, once everyone knows where they should be and then, then you sort of add that as an extra layer on top. That might, at least that's a way of, you know, that is a very limit of bit very limited experience of club rugby, is you know the, the coaches sort of nail on you get the system sorted, then we'll worry about chucking off loads in or doing weird darts and kicks. But you know, as long as you've got the basic structure, and then it's a lot easier to adapt. Or when that doesn't work, you can revert back. Um, yeah, I I, I don't know if there anyone else wants to say any more about that game. I mean, I could talk about it for hours because I just absolutely I just thought it was a great performance um speaking of not leading at all we didn't lead until we scored until that final try mm, that's true we, yeah. we, you know we were always behind or drawing so again it's a lot of what we said at the start of the season we want to keep in the fight so that we can win mm. so yeah very, very impressed with that um I said, one thing I one thing I wanted to ask Steve because he, he mentioned the the what was it like in the stands because because I, I I wasn't able to be there I don't know if you Harley were able to be there due to the distance on, on a Friday night but Steve you know what was that experience like in the stands because it seemed to be bouncing down at the at the cap yeah it was I mean I, I was in Southeast Terrace which is where, where my season ticket is and I think that's the second match in a row where it's sold out in that section mm. and when it, there's a there's a kind of a virtuous circle effect where the crowd can see the players are fighting for the results and then they respond and then the team give that back and it builds and builds and builds so by the last 20 minutes it was like a bear pit in there i mean i know cardiff arms park has a reputation for being a lot more sedate um last couple of games it has not been sedate it's been a fantastic atmosphere um and i'm really enjoying it I think yeah. I think I think that that's another game where I think everyone who went down will want to come back for the next game because it was just fun. Yeah, I don't know if anyone follows Simon Thomas, but he said straight after the game that apparently tickets are selling like wildfire for for next week's game, and that's it seems to be the inspiration, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, so people like a win, and people like going to rugby matches where there's a nice buzz in the end. That's what we got at Cardiff at the moment. Yeah, well, yeah, I agree. I think I like thinking about the app. Like last time, you know, I, unfortunately, I, I didn't make it. I said Friday, Friday night's games are a bit at the my current work situation, a bit too much of a hassle to get 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 up to cap in time. Uh, I will be there next weekend. Can't wait. I managed to get my ticket before the rush. Uh yeah, but it sounded so good. It reminded me of the buzz around the Leinster game when we, you know, and you know, Jared kicking that last minute penalty, and again, it was just like everyone hyping up and backing the players and. You know, in in the Challenge Cup run, mm. that was 2018 I, season, 2018. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Bill Bauer, you know, and again, like the crowd was building up, and then for the game, the season afterwards, then you know, can't you know, kind of had their best attendance, average attendance for for a fair few years after that, after the back of that, and mm. people rolled up and and I, I think again, it, it just I think the it opposition helps. as well. Yeah, it I affects the opposition as well because there was a lot of chat after the game about uh, the storm was making a lot of errors. Yeah. I think a certain portion of those errors were they were getting flustered because they felt the crowd on their backs, and you could see in their body language they 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 were rattled in that second half. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of those spilled balls and dodgy passes were were a product of that. Yeah, um, ready for a very clunky segue. Oh, a segue. Exciting. <laughs> I was going to say, we, we've been talking about fans. This is a fans podcast. What about the most famous? Is this the most famous fan of all, Steve? And now's your opportunity to show. 
you see. So yeah, so, uh, I mean, well, she's quickly becoming possibly the most famous Cardiff fan of all time. This is. <laughs> um... I'd just like to say for the benefit of those who are only on an audio medium and we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> if uh, Steve lets us use the image, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll flag it, we'll flag it on the, the image, socials yeah. as well. So, um, so, so he's holding up this... one of his wonderful prints, which are available, I believe. Yep. So it's easy to buy. Uh, for, for listeners, I'm holding up a wonderful print of 12 year old Jean Williams, who back in the 1950s was a sort of unofficial Cardiff mascot. Um, she was originally from Mount Dinash, I believe, and her father, I, I think, had played for Cardiff pre, um, before the war, and she had made this wonderful homemade bit of merch, which was this uh, Cardiff jersey with all the names of, of the Cardiff players kind of sewn into it, and when you watch the uh, Pathé newsreel footage of the 1953 Cardiff All Blacks match, she really stands out. And when we've been trying to build up a bit of anticipation for our Blairthing comic book online, we've been showing various images from it. The one that really catches people's imagination is Jean Williams. And I think that's because generally when you're looking back to the 1950s, it's difficult to place yourself there. When you look mm -hmm. at crowd shots of there, it's just generally like men in long overcoats black caps but then you look at young Jean in her kind of homemade merch and you just feel like you know that's someone I could see at the game nowadays she's it she really kind of brings it to life and so when we created our Blairthing comic book which is out now um she had to have a, a kind of a, a special role in there and that's what we gave her yeah well, what, why don't you explain a bit more about the Blending comic book? Because you've mentioned it a couple of times there, but yeah. for people who don't know. What we... so, so myself and James Stafford, who has written a series of um, illustrated rugby histories. I have one here for YouTube <laughs> Your viewers. Um, get his, his new one, um, Rugby Rebels, Role Models and Giant Killers. It's an excellent book. We had a conversation... 18 months ago now, about rugby heritage and how in Wales we think we're quite good at respecting the game traditions and, and heritage, etc. But in reality, we're probably not. Mm. If, when you compare it with other sports, or you compare it with rugby league, American football, soccer, we're actually a bit crap at it in Wales. I mean, for example, there's there's still no rugby museum in Cardiff which is crazy when you think about the number of people who come to Cardiff because it is synonymous with rugby so we're not very good at the heritage thing and we were thinking of ways what's a, a way of presenting it what's a, a way of sort of giving it some new impetus for people who are kind of new to it and both James and myself in the past have worked in comic books we know how to put a comic book together. So we had the idea, well, why don't we do one based around rugby? And we'll base it around one big event in Cardiff rugby history. And the obvious one with the 70th anniversary around the corner was the 1953 Cardiff All Blacks match, which Cardiff won eight points to three. Um, so we scripted it up and we found a fantastic artist named Gary Erskine, who has worked for some big, big names in comic book publishing. He's worked for Marvel, he's worked for DC. He's drawn Captain America, he's drawn Dan Dare. 30 years experience in the comic book industry. He, to my surprise, because I, I thought, well, may as well, you can always say no. He agreed to do it. Uh, and we've created it and we're really happy with it. Um, it's a tribute, first and foremost, to Blair and Williams, who... I guess is a name people know, but maybe don't know that much about. Known in his days, the Prince of Centres, um, probably like all people from his generation in rugby, they suffer a little bit from having played before Color TV came around. Um, all their big moments came, you know, th there's some footage on newsreels, there's black and white photos, but we don't have like the great teams of the 70s. We don't have color footage, but now we do have 
kind of footage in, in, the, <laughs> in the shape of a comic book that we've created. So we hope it brings that heritage and that history to life for people. And also, when you look at the background to it, Blevin Williams' background, the background of the players, what it meant to the city at that time, it's a really good story and it's a yeah. really good story to retell. Yeah, because it, it, it was, you know, that time we are talking about, you know, people talk about golden eras of Welsh rugby. The 50s was was that, but it was for the club sides as well, wasn't it? You know, it's not just the, the, the that famous win, obviously, in 53 is is it is something that's often talked about by the way, by the Wales side. But it, it's it's not often talked about the club size and how, how strong it was then. That's true. I mean, that that era for Cardiff in particular, um, that is arguably the greatest Cardiff side. Levin Williams, Cliff Morgan, Rex Willis, Sid Judd. I mean, that was a team that was feared and respected against everyone they played. Um, they should have beaten South Africa as well. They beat Australia. They really beat all cameras and they, they were being watched. I mean, for, I think for decades, right up until the 80s and 90s, the world record for a club rugby match was 48,000 who watched Cardiff play Newport um, around that time. And, you know, Cardiff Newport matches in that era would regularly get 30,000, 40,000. You're talking about the, the old, old Cardiff Arms Park being packed every week to watch these people play. And, you know, that's still post-war Britain. And having a team like that really lit up the city. Um, and it's it's an era which which deserves to be remembered because it is a glorious chapter. But as as you say... It came before Colour TV, and because it comes before Colour TV, it kind of fades away in the memory. There are only few people still around who would have watched that team play. And I think it's a little sad that it then just becomes something which is a team photo in the corner of a clubhouse, when it, it can be something that can be remembered. You know? And as I started off saying, we are quite bad at remembering in Welsh rugby. We think we aren't, but we are. But first and foremost, how how would you be able to obtain this comic book or see this comic book or read this comic book? That's, that's <laughs> the, you know, I, I, sound, I sound desperate, but I am. That's that's partly the problem. Well, if you would like to buy the comic book, which is priced at five pound fifty, including shipping, or you you would like to purchase a print of various pounds from the comic book, you can go to blethin 1953couk where it is on sale. Um, or you can go to 1823 Heritage, where uh, they're listing it on there, and it's available as a bundle featuring their... If, have you seen their, their Skull and Crossbones T-shirts? You can get it with as a bundle with one of those and a nice blue and black mug. But, yeah, the main place to get it is uh, blethin1953.co.uk. Perfect Christmas present for every Cardiff fan in your life, or yourself. It's being bought. Either my partner is getting it for me, or I'm getting it for myself. Something's happening. <laughs> I, yeah, similar situation. I think me, my mum, who's uh, you know the one who got me into rugby, and is more Cardiff mad than I am. And you know we get we I think uh, I, I probably I said thankfully she didn't really listen to the podcast, so um, I said I'll probably I'll probably slip that in there at some point as well. Maybe maybe with the skull and crossbones t shirt because she always likes extra stuff to extra layers to wear yeah, uh, down, bits, down yeah. on the south ter- south she terrace. Loves it. Um I I said the, the interesting thing for me, because obviously, I mean I know James Stafford likes having illustration, you know, a lot of illustrations in his in his history books anyway, but it is interesting that you've gone for comic format. I know you've explained a bit with your, your background in it, but it's just quite mm. nice having you know, I end up with loads of rugby books on my shelf and they you know, they all have sort of very full, you know, they all just look really formal, or it's this player, yeah. this coach, whatever. Well, the, the fact it's a comic is something different. I really like that. It's just, exactly, it's yeah. Well, like I say, we were thinking about something different and different ways of telling these stories. And for Gary, who got involved to do the artwork, a big uh, motivator for him was that he's worked in comic books for 30 or so years. And particularly in the UK, you say comic book, people tend to still think, the Beano, 
or possibly mm -hmm. superheroes. But in, in reality, you can tell any kind of story you like in a comic book format. I mean, Antoine Dupont has just had his own comic book published in France, where they have a much bigger culture around uh, comic book storytelling. There's a fantastic, uh, again, a French book telling the, the, the history of women's rugby, which, again, is, it's published in comic book format. And I think what comic books give you is, yes, they're still images, they're 2D, but if you get a really good artist like Gary, you can create a sense of dynamism and movement on the page, and you can create something really exciting. I mean, yeah. ideally, we'd have made a film about Red and Williams, but the budget wouldn't really stretch that far. <laughs> and this is the next best thing. Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've been luckily due to things Steve asked me to do early, uh, a couple of months ago. I've my I ended up managing to get a couple of sneak peeks of some of the some of the images in the panels and just the way they stand out and how vibrant and you know as I said I'm mm. thinking about like those those stuffy animals and it'll be a team photo or you might get exactly like, yeah from in the corner. It's it, it's it just it's stands the, out. I love it. Yeah, it's the complete an antidote yeah. to the the team photo in the dusty corner of the clubhouse. It's bringing that to life, you know. Because these were, you know, these were not stuffy, uninteresting people. These were fascinating people with incredible lives. And it shouldn't be that they should be in that dusty photo. It's nice to bring them to life. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> in case you missed it, so bled in 1953. Bled in 1953.co.uk. Or if you want, if you want the nice fancy T-shirt and a mug with it, then uh, try 1823 Heritage, Heritage. Yeah, which I I might plug because they've got some fantastic stuff on there. Anyway. They've got some great stuff there, and they, and they deserve some support actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I said if you do want more classic rugby merch, I I definitely recommend going to them. I was, I was just wondering, Steve, is this an isolated one, or are there plans for future sort of similar style? There, this won't be isolated, no. We're going to do these in future. Um, we think after this, we'll have kind of proven what we can do and we'll, we'll be able to do more. We're having a little debate on who, who the next uh, subject will be. Um, no spoilers? I'm Me being me, I quite like to do Frank Hancock, who features on the cover of... Um, I, I, again, for listeners, I'm holding something up to the camera. Um, who features on that? There's Frank Hancock on the cover of James's new book. Uh, I think he'd make a fantastic subject for for any kind of storytelling. I mean, but he's the man who's basically responsible for Cardiff being in the World Rugby Hall of Fame. He essentially helped help create modern rugby for the the passing game for three quarters. Um, there's also an idea that we might do someone a bit more modern. Uh, not necessarily Cardiff, but I think James wouldn't want me to say who. But we're we're kind of put we're sort of putting that together, having our thinking caps on, and how to tell that fascinating person's story. But yeah, so no, it's not this. This isn't an isolated incident. There's plenty more to come. I, there's a watch this space slash. Yeah, there's a uh, watch this yeah. space. I'm doing. <laughs> In a beat, yeah, yeah, you well, got me. I'm not, I'm not denying it. I'm, I'm absolutely hooked. It sounds, yeah. no, it does sound fascinating, and I, um, I really hope there is a lot more to come because you know that will be, yeah. you know, for the for the benefit of uh, YouTube viewers, that that print, if you wouldn't mind holding it up again, that print is is special, and to see more work like it's that, it's a fantastic and, image, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and so it, it captures of, the imagination so easily when you know. The, and the more I see it, the more I just kind of fall in love with, with you know, with mm -hmm. her because I think her her passion for the team all these years later really comes through. And I just think about what a fantastic day she must have had on 21st November 1953. She must have been on top of the world. And it's nice to kind of bring that to life, like I say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think from one clunky segue to a, to a, to another, we've got we've got we've got a few list we've got a couple of uh, listeners' questions in and thoughts off the mm -hmm. game. So I thought I'm going to start off with you, Steve. Uh, this one's very much tongue in cheek from Dr. Paul McDonald. 
uh, someone who we both know, know quite well. Um, so he's wondering if you'd like to make a comment on the uh, tumbleweed issue in the North North Terrace. Uh, well, th th I mean, th that, that sort of links back to something I, I was saying earlier about the, the Alps Park having a reputation for being sedate. And I think part of that reputation is the camera gantry is in the South Stand or the Peter Thomas Stand. Mm. Anyone that goes to the Alps Park regularly knows the first stands and the, and the first set of terraces to fill up are always the Peter Thomas stand. But the camera is pointing at the north. Generally speaking, if the north is half full, the, the Peter Thomas stand will be two thirds full, generally. Um, yeah, if, if, if the north is three quarters full, the south stand will absolutely have sold out. But because it's pointing in that direction, you can get the impression of a fairly empty ground. Um, and I suppose until the ground is redeveloped, which touch wood will happen, um, you're always going to have that problem because even if you sell out the North Terrace, there are always going to be spaces at the side because that was built at a time when you were allowed to jam a hell of a lot more people in there than you are in the modern health and safety mm -hmm. rules. So it's you 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 can only fit in you know maybe two thirds of what was a you know it, it can actually hold, and naturally they will congregate towards the middle. So and I think there's a the, there's the a large optics bit are a bit crap. as well. Pardon? <clears throat> Sorry, I think there's a large bit as well where S four C and BBC uses their TV bit on the. That's uh, right. The north, yeah, yeah. There's only the northwest bit, yeah. side. You so it's this huge block that so, was yeah. empty because it's a camera crew period. So yeah, the tumbleweed issue, I know what he means. The, the optics aren't great, but like I say, to be at the Alps Park the last couple of weeks, it there has not been tumbleweed, it has been noisy. It's one thing I thought I thought they did really well when with um, Wales women uh, at the Alps Park, where they they intentionally only sold the North Terrace first and then they sold the North Sun first and then opened up to the south because then it yeah. again, because they were aware of the, the camera issues. I mean, I did have a friend who uh, joked with me. The only reason that the cameras in the south stand is because if it was in the north, they'd have nicked them. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Possibly true. Uh, um, yeah, going to. I said, I don't know if you want to. I said, have you got the uh, questions up, uh, Cohen? Or no, oh. no, I can keep going through. Yeah, no, crack on, crack on. I um, have... So, I think. Well, we've got quite so. I'm not going to go with ones on the post, but ones that came up after the match quite quite a lot. So is Mason Grady. So I think we all agreed he had a fantastic game on the wing. So a lot of people asking, is wing his position now, or is he still a centre? Is he someone who can do both? I mean, I suppose the answer is he can do both. Um, if I'm really honest, I think I would lean towards the wing at the moment. Um, the reason I say that is because when you get these situations where he's able to run the ball back at people from the wing, he looks bloody terrifying. Um, the space he has, the the, the defence isn't set as well as it is from, from a set piece if he's in the centre. Um, he's a real threat running the ball back from a kick. Um, and also, I mean, I... I think during the Bulls game, they targeted at him a little bit with kicks. And not only did he catch them cleanly, but he, you know, he he was then on the rampage, and that's a real weapon to have. Um, I suppose if he's on the wing, you've got to kind of allow for that and make sure you've planned for ways to get the ball in his hands, which you know, we did with that line-out move. But yeah, he can absolutely do both. But at the moment, I, I'm leaning towards winger. I think. Um, I like go on, Hardy. I'm, I was, was going to say, for me, basically, on certainly on in terms of attack, not so much the, an attacking thing, but defensively, I think the sort of tackles you have to make as a winger and decisions, I think he's really good at. Whereas mm. I feel like when you're in the 13 channel, you've got to be a little bit more, and I think he needs more time to develop. To the point of, I'd say that. Maybe do keep chucking him in at thirteen for towards the end of the game. So instead of having a centre on the bench, you keep Grady on the wing and you bring him in. Similar to what we were trying with Owen Lane at, at points and get him to develop because he does remind me of a young George North, and I think he does have all the attributes to be able to be a wing slash centre. 
But I think also, you know, he also got pulled into Wales a little bit too early because he's yeah. so like George North. He was, a, you know, it, it seemed like a direct, an easy direct replacement in the system. So, I'd, you know, I'd like to just see him develop and just have plenty of game time. And, you know, as St- Steve, as you mentioned, you know, seeing him in the ball's hand and his high ball work is so much better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I know he's got the, the benefit of being like 17 foot tall. <laughs> But, you know, it, it still does take effort. You know, there are plenty of tall people who can't catch high balls. You know, you, you see, you know, you don't just throw your second, you know, there's a reason you don't drop your second rows into the backfield. Yeah. One, because they get lost if they're too far away from their other second row. And two, because they're just, you know, two, because, you know, to get up, because, you know, you've actually got, you know, the springiness to get up. I mean, frankly, chuck him in, chuck him in most lineups. That will confuse the hell out of teams. Because they won't know if he's actually a genuine option or if he's just there as a decoy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go on, cut for coming. I said I think I've had my two cents yeah. list. Yeah, I've I've got a few different things on this. I think um, if you were looking back historically, people would say he's at the moment probably Cardiff's most potent attacking threat. So therefore, you want to get him his hands on the ball as much as possible. Historically, that would have been saying playing at centre. The way the game works now, you're bringing your wingers in from here, there and everywhere. He is so useful off the ruck in that Josh Adams, the way Josh Adams can do it sometimes, as we mentioned on previous pods. Um, that's, that's why I'd be tempted to 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 let him have a few games in on the wing. The, the one thing against that, and I'm so glad to see Lilo back, and I don't mean this in any way disparagingly, but eventually Lilo is going to move on. I know no one wants to see it happen. Eventually it's going to happen. Then who's the 13? And I've said that before. And I think that could be Grady, could well be Grady. If it is going to be, he needs to get that game time and opportunity to learn to defend um, successfully in that position. Um, cause, because I think, I, I do think centre might be his best position in the future. Um, and at the moment, maybe wing, you you see more of, you know, he's not being caught out defensively as much, but the only way he's going to develop as a centre is if he learns, and he's only going to learn by playing. So um, that would be my counter to it. I, I I get what Steve's saying with as well with, you know, and, and yourself, Harley, by being so good under the high ball, if you're good under the high ball, you're good at breaking tackles, you're brilliant one-on-one, that pretty much fits, and you're brilliant at one-on-one tackles, you pretty much fit the bill as a winger. But I just, I don't know, I, I, I feel there's a space there at 13 that that he more than fills and um, will do so very successfully in the future, I'm sure. Yeah, I think- uh, it's a sort of half good. half sitting on the fence thing there. there. <laughs> to be fair yeah, for me. Yeah, I, I feel like we're. I think we're all like. Do you know? I think as long as he's on. I think for me, I think he's just got to be on the pitch. And yeah. then I think you. And then you you work out where from then. I mean, one thing I've noticed that Cardiff have done for a while because they have the wingers coming in midfield and picking up the rocks is the thirteen does spend a lot of time on the wing anyway. Yeah. So I said for me, it's not necessarily an attack thing. It's almost more the defense. Where I think, you know, is it a case of do you want to give him a bit of time here and there so it, until he gradually builds up the confidence, and then move him in full time whilst we still have um, Lilo and Willis to to fill the 13 jersey? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, a uh, cu- couple of cut ones, um, just gonna go through from uh, from uh, Liam. Uh, well, he's, he's he's on Twitter as everything Cardiff rugby and football, but I know it's you, Liam. Um, so, First, his first one, which we can either go over depending on how nice he is. Do we think we've ended up with a better deal getting Reese Litter- Litterick over Dylan Lewis? And then the sec, which I feel link- leads into the second part question, which is for the- so far this season, who do you think has been our standout forward and standout back? So, as you're the guest, Steve, I'll let you uh, take whichever bits you want. Do I think that. we've had the better deal by getting Litterick over Dylan Lewis? Um, my first reaction is yes. Because I mean, I'm not. I don't want to dis, dis, disparage Dylan Lewis, but it comes back to what I was saying earlier about having players with a bit of a point to prove and a chip on their shoulder. And with Reese Litterick, you've got a player who 
I think was playing quite far down the divisions in England until quite recently. I mean, he was with Worthing, wasn't he? I mean, it's I mean, it's a couple of a couple of divisions below even the championship, and he seems to have got into Harlequins after playing a couple of A games for them, and was actually released by Harlequins fairly quickly. Um, and so, from his point of view, this is probably his, you know, potentially his last chance at grabbing professional rugby by the horns, and that is what he's doing. He's he's been a real find, been very very impressed by by Reese Litterick. Um Dylan Lewis, of course, on the other hand, is an international player. Um, but I think when you take into account that international players aren't there every week, and Reese Litterick is really giving it the beans at the moment, yeah, I think we've got the better part of the deal. I. I'm going to answer through omission, I think. Um, I think Litterick has performed extremely well at the start of the season. Um, yeah. yeah. And I... I, uh, um, I uh, There's a lot that Dylan Lewis can do that Litterick can't. You know, his work around the field, turnovers, yeah. etc. Uh, that's not something I'm expecting for Reese Litterick. But so far in the scrum, I think he's held his own. I think he's been very strong and he's you know, I joked earlier about scoring an 80 yard try, but I think so I think it was something like his first try, he said to Jock, his first try since under elevens rugby or something ridiculous yeah. like that. You know, that's what a time to get for it. me. Yeah. yeah. Instant hero. <laughs> I think that that makes you I, I whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I I'm taking that down as folklore, to be honest. That's um you know, what a time to score it at home to the Stormers when you're you 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 know what six games into your career as a Cardiff player? So um, yeah, fair play to him. I think he's I think he's hit the ground running and really impressed since um, since coming down. Yeah, I I, mean, I agree with what you guys say. You know, expanding on the whole thing of you know Dylan Lewis being international, not playing a lot, he's also going to have cost a lot more than Litrick probably would have. Mm. I'm I, and having the chip on the shoulder. I mean, he was you know he stepped behind Simon Kerridge and Wilco Lowe, and they were two of the best scrummaging tight heads in the Premiership. Yeah. And you know we saw what Wilco Lowe did it for eighty minutes against us last season. And you know someone, someone one of the Scarlets uh, supporters, I know he he point he was like, well, but talking about you know who was to blame between Kemsley Matthias and and uh and uh, Reece Littrick when Matthias got pinged, basically pinged off the park, and he, and he was oh well you, you know he's third choice of Harlequins. I went yeah, and then you watched Wilco Lowe and you're like that's why he was third choice because Wilco Lowe is unbelievably good. And you know, it proving that you know he is good enough for this standard. He's a bit cheaper. We're probably saying this, Gatlin will probably call him up because that's the way things things seem to happen with in in the in the Welsh in the Welsh clubs is you you unearth an absolute gem and they get rushed into the rushed into the national side. But you know, in theory, he's better business, regardless of what you think of both belays, because he's he's cheaper and he's gonna be there for. So you're getting a lot more bang for your buck. Yeah. And you know, he has but he has put in some very big performances before, you know. I, I you know, I don't want to neg on Dylan Lewis, but I mean Litterick is playing very, very well. You know, we thought he might be third choice tight, you know, third choice tight head coming in. You know, after Azarati and um oh what's to say the one that Keeper Parker. Parker. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> you know, he's making arguments. For me, he's making a very strong argument to be in the conversation for our first choice. Really, I mean, I, mean, I know I, we've got Azarati to come back, but I, I, I mean, I wouldn't pick him over Azarati. But if when we play Harlequins to lose, you know, these big games we have got around the corner, and Reese Litterick is starting at tight head, I've got no problem with that. After what I've seen in the first few games of this season, and I think that's a big compliment. Yeah, 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 yeah that's a um, if we move on to the second, the set, the sort of end to the second bit. So who? So I say, I think we both, I think all three of us are unanimously impressed with Litterick. But who do you think has been our best, uh, best forward and back so far? Um, I mean, th- there are a few contenders, but it's difficult to look past Cameron Winnett and Alex Mann as the most um, the, the standout new, new back and forward that that, that have come in. Um, Winnet looks better every week. He looks 
he, he looks so assured. You, you, you wonder what what are they putting in the water in his house? I mean, he he doesn't have the right to look so calm and composed and professional at at his age, um, and and also with his size, he's he's not mm. a big player, and he's playing in the position where he's having to you know run into or or be run into by much bigger people. Um, he's not overawed at all. Um, Alex Mann, um, Abadair Solidarity, he's a machine. Um, he is, he's knocking people back, he's winning turnovers, huge work rate. And, you know, again, going back to what you were saying about players being called up by Wales, they are both strong contenders to be picked, called up by Warren Gatlin sooner rather than later, I think. I think Alex Mann is the image of a Warren Gatlin back row forward. Um, and Cameron Winnett, I mean, there's there was some debate over who was going to play full back for Wales. I think he's you know pushing his way to the front of the queue very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think you've hit the nail on the head, both in your description of uh, well, both players, to be honest. Uh, Cam, Cam, to me, I didn't think he was that sort of player. I didn't think he was that assured, calming presence that he has been. I thought he was more Johnny McNichol esque, you know, try mm-hmm. things for him everywhere. Partly because all I, the majority of what I'd seen from him had been the Toulouse and and uh, um, Harlequins game from a couple of years ago, where he was trying things from everywhere because that was how Cardiff were forced to play with fifteen different players. So he he's an exciting prospect. Um, you know, I. It's it's a case of whether he can force his way into Gatlin's plans because you know, I don't think Gatlin would have been looking at all at him this time last year, this time two six weeks ago, really. But now he's he's shown himself to be one of the form fullbacks, well, probably the sec the second form fullback in in, in Welsh rugby at the moment behind Max Nagy, who unfortunately isn't Welsh qualified because I've watched him on the weekend, he was superb. But Cam is playing brilliantly week in, week out and deserves his kudos and you've nailed it with Alex Mann. If ever there was a player that exemplified what Gatlin will want in a six, he's big, physical, will work his socks off and he's done that. He was doing that for under 20s. You you know, there was a reason he was captain was because he worked so hard. It wasn't, that was a tough under 20s campaign that he was involved in when he was captain. It was really tough and you know, they were getting pinged here, there, and everywhere, getting yellow carded. I remember him getting yellow carded, and Wales really struggling while he was off the park. I think he got, actually might, might have got red carded in the game. I can't remember. He definitely did a high tackle, but he works so hard for his for his side, whether that be Cardiff, whether that be Wales in twenties. And he's, I already see a rapid increase and rapid uh, improvement in him, both as a leader and as a just general player. Because, yeah, that. He made a mistake a couple of weeks ago against Scarlet. I mentioned it on the pod. I mentioned it again here because of how much he's improved since then. There weren't any mistakes on the weekend. It was defensively, he seems solid. Defensively, he's now becoming almost a linchpin and he's also a line-out option. I can't see where... I haven't seen a fault in his game yet. Maybe, you know, there was, there was one loose pass perhaps on the weekend that would have been nice if it had gone to hand, mm. but... But those are the extras, and Warren Gatlin won't be looking for that. He'll be looking for what does he do? Does he work hard? Yes. Does he does he provide a lineup option? Yes. Does he want to you know defend for his life and embody that Sean Edwards um, esque mantra? Yes. So um, yeah, big fan of him, and uh, long may it continue in Cardiff shirt and hopefully in the Wales shirt in the future. And I think it's going to be quite difficult for other players to dislodge him from that card of shirt already. I think mm. Shane, I mean, we got some good sixes. I mean, Shane Lewis Hughes, Josh Turnbull, of course. I, I think that six jersey is Alex Mann's for the duration, and it's going to be very difficult for someone to take it off him. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Ab- yeah, I absolutely agree with all that. And I said, I mean, maybe not as, it may not be as much of a problem position for Wales as like tight head and 10, but. It is one Gatlin's been struggling to, to work out what he does when it's not Aaron Wainwright and Falato at eight. And with Aaron, it looks like Aaron Wainwright's probably going to end up playing a lot more at eight for Wales in the future because of Tlubin, you know, probably going to call it at some point. We don't know when, 
But also, I don't know whether or not he is going to be fit enough for the Six Nations or whether Gatland even thinks, is it worth just leaving him out for a campaign to see what we've got? Having a, knife, a, a six who is abrasive is a line net option. You know, it's not going to let you down. You know, some of these, you know, spotting, you know, opportunities for counter rucks, you know, so, you know, showing some game smarts as well. That is going to be very key. I think other forward, I mean, I'd like to say, you know, I've, I think Teddy Williams has come back from that from that uh, training camp and looks like the hard abrasive second row we've needed, I think, for quite a while. So yeah. I quite like him. Tamani's been he looks the real deal him, yeah. Um I thought um Big Mac. Uh, I thought he was absolutely fantastic for the half hour or so he came he had off the bench. Um, you know, I said we we already talked about that pick off the base and you know you know, maybe a bit of footwork or a slightly, slightly weaker defender, and he's over for the try there. But you know, like just to, just you know, just that was the explosive pace off that that base was excellent. You know, just such a great sight to see. Backs wise, again, we've mentioned him, Melis Bevan. I thought, think has been brilliant. I think he's taken this opportunity really well. Um, Brady, excellent. I thought Harry Millard's been really good as well. I unfortunately kept him off early. I mean, yeah, I think I think we're all agreed. It's Alex Mann and can win it, but yeah, the, the I, I, other, it's been other, such a, such a good team. The other player I want to mention, only because he's done much better than I I thought he was going to, is Evan Lloyd. Mm. Because when I uh, I think he was on the team sheet for the Bulls game first, and I thought, oh, I'm a bit worried about that because he's 21 years old. I don't think he's actually played that much senior rugby. And until last season, he was a number eight. Mm. And a player that inexperienced coming in to play hooker against a big South African pack. Um, you know, I, I was a bit worried about that. Um, the games he's played, both against big South African packs, he's been excellent. Um, a couple of errors, but, you know, he's winning turnovers. He's making an impact ball in hand. Um, you know, there's another really good player starting to emerge there, I think. Um, maybe not quite yet. I mean, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't start him quite yet. But th- that's another really promising player we got on the books. So yeah, it's all good news this week, isn't it? Yeah. Speaking of speaking of hookers playing well, I think Evan Daniel's been pretty decent as yeah. well. I mean, again, I mean, had a couple of errors at the line out, but I mean, can you be a hooker for Cardiff and not have a few errors every game? No, it's written like, in I'm, the contract, I'm, I'm, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I said, I mean, yeah, going back to um, Evan Lloyd's, though, that, that game against the Bulls, I said, his first line out, you could tell, was a little bit of nerves. Yeah. Spook went not wonky, but then was apps, you know, his arrows were great after that. So, yeah, he's, you know, if, if, it's definitely something I've, I have noticed for the most part, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch everything wood in, in, in this room now. For the most part, I think the line out's gone a lot better than it has in the past few seasons. <laughs> Jesus, don't speak so, too soon. <laughs> yeah, great. So, uh, so yeah, I, I apologise in advance, everyone, for uh, for us yeah. somehow managing to get zero success against Scarlet. What's wrong on the weekend? Yeah, I was, but, I was just Steve there not nailed the uh, put the nail on the head really, didn't he? When he said this is a lot more positive this week, I think someone's commented under your one of your posts, Steve, saying. Uh, they're slightly disappointed you're on this week when we don't need an excuse to be positive. Yeah, I think that was big Tony, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah um, I think I think from from my perspective, uh, certainly last week and the week before, it was frustration. Um, you know, seeing see, we've seen this Cardiff side grow and how it's improving, how it's getting better week in week out, but just not getting over the line. I think that was the frustration rather than any um, mm. maybe the negativity. I, I you know I hold my hands up to that. I am uh, probably captain negative, captain leader, <laughs> legend of the negative team if there ever is one. But um, yeah, it, it's frustration more than anything else. And I think on the weekend, we sh- uh, kind of showed exactly what they can provide, which is a team that can stick in there, have gl- have moments of absolute brilliance, you know, two brilliant tries, but can get do the dirty work, get over the line. And if I'm honest, I think that's likely to be become more the case when... You know, well, one player we haven't mentioned, Jim Bothan, comes back. That's, that's oh, yeah. yeah, as yeah. well. You know, that players like him, you... players like Josh Adams, who I'm sure we're going to talk about in a bit, players, players like Owen Lane, those players who finish opportunities every chance they get and create opportunities for others out of nowhere. So, um, 
yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited for the for the future. That, that's yeah, the point. Sure. Like, where, do, where do you put where do you put both of them? You've got so many people playing well. Like, I mean, are you? Uh, you yeah, I mean, it... I mean, you know, I I was just talking about you know players we got in play six, and I completely forgot Jim Botham. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's true. Where 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 do you put him? I mean, I I want to say you, you have to pick him if he's fit, but. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult getting that back room. That's it, because I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to drop Alex Matt. Do you know? I, hmm. I think even with with Evan Fit, I quite, I'm really liking Tamani as an eight. I know we initially oh. got him to be that tight head lock, but I'm quite like, I'm quite yeah. liking him. I, off I the mean, base I mean, it is quite handy. Like, oh, who do we have to play number eight? Or oh, hang on, we have got a guy who used to play for the Wallabies at number eight. It's just, yeah, it's a happy accident, isn't it? But I mean, yeah, I mean. He, he was it's, excellent in, against Zebra. He was excellent while, for the hour or so he was on the field against Stormers. Very, again, very difficult to drop. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm loving it. And, you know, you know, we've got, you know, our captain, my captain, Josh Turnbull, he's back fit yeah. now. I, I can see him fighting for a second row berth at the moment. Yeah. It's, I'm, yeah, it's, I, it's I, a good, it's a good, I think it's a good problem to have. Yeah. And, you know, talking about optimism and being excited and being upbeat, I genuinely think this is a season that in a couple of years' time we look back on and think that was the start of something. Because mm-hmm. when you look at this squad, the age profile of it, if we can keep this group together, and, you know, it's an if because you know we all know the recent history of Welsh rugby, but we keep that group together, maybe add a couple of more players from outside here and there, keep bringing players through from you know, the terrific schools we got in the area, our universities. A couple of years' time, we could be a really serious team, um, not just like the plucky underdog thing we're still kind of doing at the moment. You know, we, we could be you know, really pushing for honours. And so you know, this is a, a big, big season, and it's a really exciting one. And I'm... I'm loving it at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So I think let's carry on this wave of optimism. So we've got... Yeah. And um, if, if anyone listening to this or watching this is in two minds about whether you should be coming down to the Arms Park this season and thinking, oh, maybe they're done, get rid of that thought and, and come down because it's a really good place to be at the moment. Yeah, I said unfortunately, I think that was our last Friday Friday night game at at, at home, which is annoying because I I finally in a position where I can start going to Friday night games again. Mm. But you know, <laughs> I'm it, it's still one of my favourite atmospheres. But I'm hopefully making up with uh, plenty more games from it yeah. as I uh, soon look, relocating to Cardiff again. Um, so I said, keeping the wave of optimism for those on YouTube, you'll see I've got two jerseys behind me, both both provided kindly by Will Boyd. Um. So we're we're going to be facing his uh, his old team, Scarlets. That's... They did not have a good game against Ospreys. Are we thinking there's going to be a backlash, or do we think that we've hit a point now where it's going to be? I I mean, I predict on the wrap that we're going to beat him by at least ten, because I feel like we've got enough. Which again is just asking for us to get get it yeah. get wrong. But yeah, I felt I when that. we played them at Parker Scarlets. The biggest issue for us, our attack, attack wasn't functioning. And yeah. now it looks like the attack seems to be clicking and their defence somehow seems to be getting worse every game. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I didn't see the Scarlet's Ospreys game. I, I was a bit surprised by the scoreline. Um, I know they got problems there, but I was still a bit surprised by the scoreline. Um, I think this is possibly going to be one of those games where if we get a lead early, Scarlet's heads might drop a little bit and then we could really impose ourselves. But if that doesn't happen and they find a way in, they, they'll have a good travelling support. I mean, I say travelling support. Most of them would have travelled down from Poncana. But they'll have a lot of people on the North Terrace. If that, if that contingent gets behind them, if they get a little bit of an edge early on, it's going to be quite a sticky game. So it's going to come down a lot to how we start the match. Um, but we're, we're, we're definitely favourites for this one, and for good reason. But it, I, I, it, I think it's going to be another tight one. I, I'll be surprised if it's not another one-score game. Uh, I, 
the way Scarlet's played last week, I uh, no. Um, I think Cardiff could win by a country mile, I, and I'm and I don't mean to put the knockers on it, but I I was there yesterday. Sorry, yesterday. Um, and um, supporting the Ospreys partly because. <laughs> I I was with my uh, partner's family who are all Scarlet's fans and just wanted to be the black sheep even That's more than I already am. Um, but at, at the moment, there there's two there, there were two major issues Scarlet's had in that game, which were the front row couldn't compete against a strong Ospreys front row. You know, Nicky Smith, we all know how strong he is as a scrummager on both of the other sides. And the back row is still inexperienced. And it was up against uh, Reese Davis, Jack Morgan, Morgan Morse, which is, which was who was all superb, and that's where the game got dominated. Really, the the other problem they've got is they've got a ten and a fifteen who, if they've got go forward ball, are uh, in the game, are uh, and it's loose, it's open, and it's free running. They are huge threats, but if it's wet as it was on yesterday, if they're behind chasing the game. They struggle and they read that second half performance from from Scarlets um, was I would say worrying if you're a Scarlets fan and I I don't say it lightly you know the 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 lack of you know we mentioned leadership the lack of someone saying right let's tighten things up a bit let's just get a bit of territory you know they got a fifty twenty two with um, Joe Roberts's kick but apart from that they didn't really get much territory that second half they had a couple of scrums penalties they just did a scrum penalty to a scrum penalty to nothing and it was it was a very frustrating game to watch if you're a Scarlets fan there were lots of players who you know the, the, there's a last play of the game where the fours just weren't working hard enough and I appreciate by that point they're 31-9 down but I, I do think this is a side that are at the moment really struggling for confidence and Cardiff are coming from the complete opposite bouncing off, off the back of a win I I just I struggle to see how Cardiff don't win the game because at the moment the back row seems a more cohesive unit that Cardiff have got. The the front row seems a more cohesive unit at the moment as well. So if you've got those two areas, I struggle to see where we're Scar- Scarlet's can hurt you, but I I don't think they've they've got it in them at the moment to beat Cardiff on uh, on Saturday and. Yeah, that's a, that's a long and short of it. I I I'd agree with. I'd, I'd probably stretch out to fifteen points. Um, Cardiff win. That that if I was to really put the knockers on it and really um sort of rub it in, what I think that prediction is going to be because, um, yeah, that Scarlet second half performance was was a bit worrying. I must say, from a Scarlet perspective. Sorry, I should say <laughs> <laughs> we owe them one. So you know, we we. We we owe we owe the Scarlets a bit of a beating, but I'm not going to predict that because I have too much respect for the Marcus gods. But I, I yeah, games against the Scarlets can be a bit weird and can creep up in you and be a bit unexpected. So I'm mm-hmm. going to stick with it being a one score game, but I, I think we will win it. Yeah, I think I think the big thing for me is again we we point out all the like different set of battles. I like our kicking game was far better than theirs when we were at Park Scarlets. It hasn't, you know, our kick game is only going to improve having ben, if we keep Ben Thomas at 12, you know, have that extra option. Our scrum was better, I think. And, you know, Wynn Jones isn't looking great at the moment. Kenzie Mathias, apparently he's been injured. That's why he was having some issues. Steph Thomas and, um, oh, was the other the other O'Connor. And you got Harry O'Connor Harry. on the tight side. You got Harry on the tight, and then there's another O'Connor as well. Oh yeah, well, so yeah, might be the brother. Or, it might be a brother or cousin or something. He, you, you know, he's like a bit lower down the pecking order on the loose head side. You know, it's I, I can see him doing better there. I think our second rows, the most, you know, I think we could probably pick any two of our second rows. I think they'd be if if Lousy's still still injured. So I think he is still off. Yeah, I think if if you got Lousy and Fafita there, I think I think the thing that seemed to cost us in games like that were players like Lousy, Fafita. Gareth Davis, Callum Afroni, these guys coming up and stepping it big and using moments of business again in these tight, sticky games. So I, you know, as I said, I think a big issue for us last time out was the attack was really, really clunky. 
now it's smoothing out. I imagine it's probably well. You'd hope it's going to be better again. I mean, I'm very optimistic, which worries me a lot. Because <laughs> usually that's when Cardiff do a Cardiff and bite me in the ass. But yeah, there's there's further reason for us to be negative in the future. Now you're setting it up for us, are we? <laughs> <laughs> If if we the lose, only reason that, to be that negative ex- is supernatural. Yeah. Is this mm. is this an excuse for us to now? If if we lose, is now we've just got to be negative every game and hope for the best. Because <laughs> then, <Yeah. laughs> because I'd rather be I'd rather Cardiff prove me wrong by being ne- when when I'm being negative and then being awesome than me expecting them to be awesome and prove me wrong by. But yeah, I. I'm speaking. Should we move on to sort of a rough idea of our team? For me, unless he wants to carry on with his. Switching in the front rows, I think keep. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing Belgians are going to start as captain again, as, as if he's fit. Whether you bring Carry in, and you know, it seems to be working quite well. The the loose heads rotating around. I think Kieran Park Parker's back from his ban now. I think this is his first game back. I don't know if he comes in or if you keep Will da- Will Davis King. And again, you know, move him to bat. Um, start Litterick. Any th- any thoughts front row wise? I think. It's not really a huge amount of selection. It's, it's, hard to say, it's, hard, it's hard to say with Parker, isn't it? Because we've we, we've only seen... I mean, he looked pretty good in pre-season, but um, we've only seen that sort of 20 minutes against Benetton where he looked keen, but un- unfortunately a bit too keen. Um, Sherrod will have a better idea from seeing him in training whether he's ready to come straight back in. Um, in a perfect world, we'd have Azarati, but apparently he's still injured, I think. I think, um, I think there's so another yeah, week tricky. or two for him. I think I think Litterick starts, but mm. I'm I'm not sure about the bench. I I would agree. Um, you know, that you know, Scarlet's Scarlet's were missing Sam Wainwright on the weekend, obviously through tragic circumstances with his father passing. But the the I think that's an area to get at Scarlet at the moment is their yeah. front row. So I I'd like to see I'd like to see Litterick start. Um, I think it'd be too much to put on Parker to start um, having, you know, obviously been out for so long after such a, well, momentous, is that the right word? Possibly not, but ending to his first game. But um, he, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'd I, start Litterick and I'd, I'd probably go with Parker on the bench if, if, if he's up to it. Um, and I mean that, you know, obviously it's going to be a difficult one for him. You know, having uh, spent so much time on the sidelines, so hopefully he's uh, back rearing to go. Yeah, and then um, just, yeah, I was going to lead into second rows, which I, I, we seem to say every week, same again, and then it never is. So I don't know, yeah. I don't know what you think this week, Harley. Would you like to see Turnbull start? I mean, I yeah, I mean he, you know, he's club captain, so if you feel like he should should be starting, but then you know it's like. Do you move to you know? Do you drop drop him for Thornton for Seb? You know, does you know if um Teddy's fit again? Does he come come back in as well? It's it it. I said the second. We it's, it's a weird situation for Cardiff um having a lot of discussion in the second row, and it's not about yeah. which flank are you <laughs> moving, which is which is quite which is quite nice for us. Um, I mean, I like you know it's Derby if 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 fit. I I I quite like to see Teddy Teddy in there. Maybe have. Turnbull inside or Seb. I mean, that seems to that was seeming to work quite well for that for a couple of games. I think if Teddy's fit, he starts. Yeah, agreed. Um, And and I would say with Turnbull and let Seb be an impact replacement. Um, In the back of my mind, I think maybe Thornton should stay because he's a strong line out forward, and that's something we. We want to make sure he's clicking. Um, but assuming Teddy's fit, I, I would probably go with Teddy and Turnbull in, in, in the engine room there. We're probably losing a little bit of size maybe by, by having Turnbull in there. But against the Scarlets, who uh, we're, we're saying they have a relatively underpowered pack, we could probably get away with it. So, yeah, I, I would say te- Teddy and Turnbull for me. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Teddy and Seb or Teddy and Thornton just, just to have Turnbull on the bench for that mm. experience. I really like that closing it out experience off the bench. That's, that's, and I, that sounds 
really unfair then to have your club captain brought on for the final 10 just to, or for final 20 just for experience. But at the moment, while he's still um, uh, getting his way back to match fitness, um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather have him on the end of the game than lose him after 50 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. end up in a similar situation as we have in the first couple of weeks. But no, I, I yeah. It's 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 nice to have choices. Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I said, and then speaking of selection headaches, we've got we've got the back row. I mean, I don't know how much of a headache it is because this is one where I feel like it same again all the way. Like I'm, you know, I'm really liking the balance of Tamani, Alex Mann, and Ellis Jenkins. Yeah, it's same again, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what the what the situation is with Thomas Young. I know he was out with it. He was cited. He was mentioned as having a minor injury, but. I think that back row w- w- worked so well the last game. It's difficult to drop d- yeah. drop anyone. Um, Th- Thomas Young, uh, again, a, a great guy to have coming off the bench. We need to change the game, or hopefully, if we want to really put the Turks to the sword in the second half. Mm. But yeah, I, I think Definitely. same again. Yeah, I think I think the only other option is. Um, I mean, I, I want to you know don't want to be throwing my Big Mac in every game. You know, he's still. Quite a, quite a young lad, by all accounts, so you don't want to be ruining his body too much. But, I mean, maybe if you want to have that impact, you know, you're having Tamani carrying up them solidly for 50, 55, 57 I, I suppose minutes again. What, what, one issue back. with Tamani might be, you know, can he actually play every week? Because he seems to be carrying a lot of injuries and he yeah. put in, he's put in some massive shifts the last couple of weeks. So I mean, that, that, might might be, be, you know, that might be an option, a route to bring in um, uh, Turnbull in and bring him in. Play, yeah. 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 So, um. But yeah, I said I back. I said back. Back five for Cardiff. Always a always fun selections for various reasons. Half backs. Um. I think if Thomas is fit, he's straight back in. Or do we? Or do we trust? Or do we trust Bevan again? How controversial can we go? I, I'd start Jamie Hill. Bevan. I'd be tempted to start Bevan. Mm. And I, I, I realized that better, might be, actually. Yeah, I I feel like he's I feel like that last game against the Stormers it showed he earned it, and actually yeah, maybe again with that impact off the Thomas with that impact off the bench and you know theory you know leadership again I think it, again he was another one whose list was having a niggle last week. Yeah, actually, do we want to rest him? Do we want to save? Do we want to save Thomas for the the actual big games? Not you know these little uh, Mickey Mouse against the bottom of the table. Bottom of the URC teams. I think, I think I, that would know, so that age like milk. Um, I think it's not so much a case of resting Thomas as Alice Bevan I think Bevan's started a, looking the real deal last week. So maybe just leave him there and see how he goes, see how he yeah. keeps developing. And then you've yeah. got, an, assuming Thomas is fit, you've got an exceptional player to bring off the bench, maybe yeah, even an outside said. half. So. Yeah, and <laughs> and also and also you've got a, a player who. I think if there ever there was a player who won't take dropping well in in the best of ways, I mean, as in he will he'll go. I've been dropped here. I'll Why take have that I been personally. dropped? Here? I I want to prove a point. There's yeah. a, if there's ever been a player, I think Thomas will prove that point. I think that's why I'd like to. I, I it's another reason to stick with Bevan. I think it'll be it, Thomas needs competition. I think it'd be good for to, for Thomas to have competition, and I think Bevan has earned his right as as Steve says. You know, he yeah. It was such a successful performance last week. Why change? And yeah. you know, he's not. You know, we can skip ten because Sheriff's not going to change that. So let's move to. Yeah, it's, it's going to be. It's going. It's going to be Devere. It's going to be Devere. Yeah. Um, I I think the only thing is what the bench option is going to be, or if we go, if we carry on the same way we have been, where we've had back, you know, people in the sort of. Back would, would you centers. start? Um, would you start Gabriel Hamer Webb this week? I was about to. Say, I was going to leave wingers till a bit later, but you know what? Let's okay. let's go because I think back three is going to be actually quite an interesting one with a bit of with the mm. the, the news that Josh Adams might be. Oh yeah, yeah. again. Because yeah. I think yeah, back three could be quite quite a tasty tasty one as well. Because actually, mm. to be honest, everything from twelve to well, I'd say twelve to fourteen because I feel like for me fifteen, it's can win it again. Yeah, I feel like that's a fairly assured one. As much so, I I like Beatham every time he's been on. I think Camden is just making himself undroppable at the moment, or as near as you can be. Yeah, yeah he is. Yeah. So, um, what do you think, Wings? If Adams is fit, I think first and foremost, from a player safety point of view, I hope um, 
I, I kind of there's part of me that hopes Harry Miller is doesn't feature this weekend because that was when hell of a knock and yeah. um I just think it's probably best he does have a week off and it, it has come at a in in all for for Cardiff as a whole a, a better time when Hamer Webb's come through and played well and Josh Adams back. Um, Hamer Webb based on absolutely nothing, and I think Josh Adams is one of the best wings in the world. But um, I I just I, I really enjoyed his performance. Uh, Josh easing back in. Um, you think yeah, thinking of Adams on the bench then maybe, and then having Grady on the other wing. Yeah, but that means dropping. That means dropping probably a, a Beetham from your twenty three, doesn't it? So that's that's what's difficult about it, because Beetham had Beetham deserves to be part of the twenty three as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think that maybe Josh is your twenty three, but I don't know. I, oh, Steve, what do you think? I said, I said, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 that's what I do. I, I'd have Hamer where Grady on as starting wings and Adams on the bench. Um, Adams, of course, can cover centre as well. Um, don't swear on this podcast. I mean, you can swear <laughs> on this podcast, but that is swearing on this podcast. I was about to add a pinch. Oh, you can cover for say he's he's wing and fullback, and then and then it, okay. it covers all things. <laughs> and we'll, we'll just have beef and play get beef and play cover 12. It's yeah. that's why right. I think centers. Um, I'm really liking Ben Thomas at 12. I'd like to see, I think, just the, I think giving him a bit more time. I don't know if we want to bring the the dream team of Hala, Holo, and Lilo out, or have one on one start, one on the bench again. Or I, again, I, I with, think with Grady covering thirteen. I mean, you don't necessarily need them both. That's true. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's Ben Thomas twelve, and then it it comes down to where the pick Hala, Holo, or his mate at thirteen, and I think that's a time cost. Yeah. Yeah, Part of me true. feels like I'd like Lilo because he is the better defensive player and the more mm, natural 13. That, yeah. As great as halaholo has been, I do feel like, because we are probably, you know, we're looking at probably a Johnny Williams or, you know, Johnny Williams, which should be, I feel like is an easy one to contain because he is just, he's he's just a slightly bigger, less effective Kieran Williams, uh, oh. as we proved on the weekend. I'm saying that purely because I know it's going to wind up a, a couple of my Scarlet's friends um, and very controversial. I, I, I should add my face was more uh, saying that was a bit hard on Kieran Williams, is it not? But uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I'm pushing it too far there. <laughs> um, but it's one of those, yeah, I think, you know, you do want someone, I, but for me, I think Joe Roberts, particularly Joe Roberts shows he's quite a yeah. depth 13. I think his kicking game, I think his rugby IQ is quite up there. So actually yeah. having him having a good a thirteen who's defend you know is a lot more solid. Not that Hall yeah. would let us down. Well, I'm, I'm also them. thinking if on the bench we've got Thomas Williams, Hall and Josh Adams, that's that's some that quite would nice high players that would, doing I think, the bench. Yeah. I think Scarlet's be shitting themselves with that thought. Yeah, that's that is chaos incarnate. No yeah. matter which way round, no matter who you're subbing for yeah. who. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. I, I, I definitely start Lilo at thirteen. My only temptation would be maybe Halla Hollow at twelve, just purely for his size. But I think Ben and then, showing and then Ben Thomas to bench, and I guess for that one. Yeah, but I think Ben. Like I was just going to say, I just think Ben's shown what he can do defensively and in attack that he he is big enough and runs clever enough lines and can tackle well enough to play twelve um, against. You know, Johnny Williams is a big unit. Sometimes, you know, when he when he gets it right, he can get it very right, but. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, Joe Roberts is 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 a good is a really good player. So um, I'd like to see a proper thirteen going up against him. I think this week. Yeah, I think it's fair to settle. So watch us be pretty and surprisingly wrong, despite the very limited choices. Um, any other any other thoughts for for Saturday other than get yourselves down to cap? Um, you know, tickets are selling fast. You know, particularly if you want to be in the best terrace, the South Terrace. Exactly. <laughs> I was just about to say, there's one more question, which was from Cardiff Blues UAE, which we didn't yeah, actually sorry, sorry, I did, I did, jump yeah, on that. Yeah. Um, I, I just thought we'd answer it before we go, because it says six games in, what do we think are realistic goals? Top 10, maybe. Best Welsh region, although the O's are looking solid. Um. Top ten would be nice. 
I think I think it's definitely achievable. Just about because the the second half of the season is going to be tough, as we've mentioned several times. But um, best Welsh region is that is the other one that you know. Okay, it doesn't give you Europe this year, a uh, top level Europe this year, but it still is a nice uh, little badge of honour to have. And I don't think, well, Dragons haven't been as improved as I thought they'd be this season. Scarlet seem to have taken a slight step backwards so far or struggling, definitely struggling for confidence. Ospreys have won some games, um, close games and won them well, but have a really horrible end to the season. So I think there's there's an opportunity there. Um so that's that's the one that I'd I'd like to see if if Cardiff can remain as best Welsh region because that's something I wouldn't have predicted before the season. That that would be I think that would be a successful season. I don't know about either of you, Steve. What what do you think? Um in terms of targets, um I'm not sure about league position, but I think in terms of achievable targets, I think Knocking one or two teams over in Europe is a plausible target because we're kind of going in as the sort of ugly stepchild of the Champions Cup. No one thinks we're going to do anything. But I think we're a better team than people reckon. And I think you know, Harlequin's coming to Cardiff, Bath coming to Cardiff. I would love to knock one or both of those teams over. And I think it's doable. And I think results like that would give the whole club a further shot in the arm. So rather than thinking too much about league placings, I think doing something in Europe in terms of pull, you know, pulling a couple of teams' pants down, that's the achievable target that I'm looking at, I think. Um, as for URC, it's difficult because I haven't looked at, I haven't really looked at how you know the fixtures of falling for all the other teams but there's there's not much between us and, and the top 10 um and i think you know based on the f- first few weekends of urc it's it's actually a pretty even tournament i think um, yeah, that's we, we certainly haven't been overawed by anyone yet so yeah but yeah my in terms of achievable goals doing something in europe let's you know let's shock a couple of people so at the start of the season, I predicted that I think a good season for Cardiff would have been Welsh Shield, get you know retain the Welsh Shield and maybe squeak into the playoffs. I think it's going to be hard, you know, particularly with our running. But I think it's, I think it's certainly possible. Um, again, I'd like to see. So Europe last couple of seasons, you know, you only needed one win and maybe pick up a couple of losing bonus points here and there to get into the last sixteen, and then it's knockout rugby and you never know what happened in knockout rugby. Yeah. Even then, if we miss that, you know, as long as we don't finish dead last, then we go into the Challenge Cup. And let's be fair, there's no Welsh side better at the, doing the Challenge Cup than Cardiff. <laughs> um, and that could actually could be a route into Europe next year. Because something we briefly touched on the wrap was um that you know is that maybe a better target for Welsh sides if we've got an aspiration to play Champions Cup rugby next season? If I mean, maybe not necessarily the best thing for us. But I mean, you are then playing the bigger teams, and you're going to draw crowds. You know, it's actually maybe willing that you know it might actually be easier to win the Challenge Cup than it is to make top eight in the URC because it's so competitive. Although, um, again, was it we're round six now? There's not a single unbeaten team. There's not a single team who hasn't got a win, which I think is the first time in the Celtic League, as it you know, it's various guises I think's happened. I mean, saw some someone be able to quickly check fact check me on that one, but. I'm pretty sure there's usually always been like one unbeaten team and one team who's not managed to get a win from anything. So actually, it, be, it seems quite competitive this season. Just a reminder, Harley, where can they at you if they uh, <laughs> if someone does find that out to be incorrect? <clears throat> um, I am at Worthy Harley because Twitter swapped me first and surnames round. That's not me actually trying to be a particularly too big big on on X. I'm also I've also very recently joined Blue Sky at Harley W. So. Uh, you know, you can you can you can uh, have a go at me on nice Twitter as well if you really fancy it. Yeah, or you could just directly go to the pod, which is of course at Cardiff underscore Central on Twitter. Um, yeah, if you want to at us about that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if that is true, but that yeah, it has seemed to be a bit of mid-table fighting this season, which is uh, good to see. Um, with the uh, 
perennial issue of travelling out to South Africa being a bit of a problem for everyone. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I say I feel like we've we sort of briefly gone into. I think unless anyone's got anything burning they want to say, um, Steve, where can we where can we find you on on the socials if you wish to be found? Um, uh, I'm I'm not convinced I'm going to stay on Twitter because I'm finding it so annoying. But my on socials, I'm at uh, s under slash coomzy c double o m b s y. Blevin has its own uh, Twitter account or X account, which you can find at at Blevin underscore nineteen fifty three, and there's the website uh, Blevin nineteen fifty three dot co uk. Excellent, Karen. Do you want do you want your socials out, out out for the world, or just hope and maybe see if people find you there? It is one hundred percent not worth it. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> well, no, I, I've I've already made a note of that, and I'm going to try and slip the uh, website address of Blair Day into my partner downstairs somehow in in a un, in a very unsubtle Christmas gift, please. So that's the check out, uh, we'll check out this cool thing. Yeah, check out this cool comic that I'm really excited about. Please, please, please. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much, Steve, for coming on. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure. Or about um. Or about your project and uh well and the products to come yeah exactly yeah it's, it's been fun guys I've, I've really enjoyed it i'm sure, I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll find find reasons yeah. to have you on any other time buy my comic book please buy several <laughs> buy them for your friends your partners and your children or grandchildren i uh, i think that's uh I think that's all we all, all, all for tonight. I am absolutely knackered after three <laughs> and three quarter hours of podcasting. So uh, I just want to say uh, to thank you to Catwoman again. Uh, thank you to Steve once again for bringing on thank this uh, this lovely project. Please feel free to. So if you listen to this, you're already aware that it's uh, we're on Spotify, Apple, and anywhere you get your podcasts. But also please do check out our YouTube channel and our sister, sister podcast. It's part of the rap family. And Again, remember, South Terrace is the best terrace. It is. Good night. Good night. What's that?